today, I'd like to introduce to you Kathy Louise Schuett, who is our SAGE editor and author of a, a couple of children's books. And she's going to be teaching you all about knowing the difference between telling people stuff and showing it. Because as you know, the best part about reading is getting yourself mentally into the book, the visualizations and everything. So she's going to kind of discuss that. Kathy Louise. No, I'm going to tell you all about it. <laughs> so first of all, I want to ask you all to forgive the hat. It's really not a fashion statement today. Um, I have a vision issue that makes the lights come down, make it hard for me to see you or see the screen. So I'm trying to block them out while I'm doing this. So thank you for that. Um, as Rose said, I've been your Sage editor since 2019. Um, and it's it's a fun job. If anyone wants to volunteer to be on the board of Southwest Writers, it's rewarding. Um, I know it seems like a lot of a lot of work to everybody, but it's really quite a community. You meet some great people, and you get to really make friends with them. And this is a big deal. It was a big deal to me because my paying jobs involve journalism news writing, and I was also a magazine and newspaper editor for many years in the early uh, 2000s. Um, I, I do admit to getting a little bit burned out on the news. <laughs> and so I left that to buy and run a restaurant, which I did for eight years out in Edgewood. I sold that restaurant in 2015, and I've been writing for fun and exploring my love of painting ever since. And I can say without a doubt that I love my life more than ever. <laughs> um, I also do have two children's books that I illustrated as I was learning more about my painting. I illustrated them and I, I wrote both of those too and I self-published them. So it's possible, just do it. So um, I have a question for, for some of you based on our title, Don't Make Your Friends and Family Read Bad Stuff. Um, obviously, I wanna know how many of you, and I bet it's almost all, have that go-to person who reads, edits, and or critiques your stuff probably for free. Um, maybe you have an I'll show you mine if you show me yours kind of exchange with them because those are common too. So seriously, how many of you who are in the room have, have that kind of a relationship? Yeah, I, I've, always, I've always done that too. Um, but there are so many reasons that this is a bad idea that I can't really tell you all of them. The one that I will mention is that even if these people know good writing from bad, and a lot of times they don't, they like you. They want to see your happy, smiling face. And if what you sent them is total trash, they still want to make you happy. Just, just remember that. And this desire to make you happy, what does it almost always do? It almost always equals, I thought it was great. When sometimes what they really want to say to you is, please bury this in the backyard and put a guard on it so the neighbor's dog doesn't dig it up. If they do point out a problem, hallelujah just run with it. But also know that your problem that they have pointed out may be like mice in the attic. If they see one and they're willing to tell you about it, there are probably a lot of others they're not mentioning. I know this because I have been on both sides of this fence. So here's the thing about don't make your friends and family read bad stuff is I do also know that even if I manage to convince you today that every word of critique from your friends and family is a total lie, that they tell you what they want you to hear, no matter what I counsel you on that or how cleverly I say it, your loyal friends and family are likely to continue to be the first to see your work. In some cases, some of you out there in online land, it may be as early as this afternoon. Knowing the truth of this, my real advice to you is 
guess what? <laughs> Only write good stuff, right? <laughs> Just don't write anything bad. I too wish it was that easy. So Brenda, the next slide, please. So one of the one of the ways that I've found to improve your writing really quickly is to figure out the difference between showing and telling. Like many of you, I've attended dozens of Southwest Writers meetings. I've listened to all those speakers and I've taken notes on most of them. And I would say that nearly two thirds of the speakers we've heard here in the past five years have said that to make your writing better, you need to show, don't tell. And you know what happens after that? These comments on the middle of the screen. Invariably, I'll be sitting in the audience and someone in the crowd will whisper something along the lines of, that's great, but how do I know the difference? That's why I've decided that the best thing I can do to help out your friends and family, and you, of course, is to point out a few easy ways you can identify showing and telling in your own writing. First, a couple of clarifications, disclaimers, if you will. These Southwest Writers speakers are seasoned writers. Believe me, showing is second nature to them. And a lot of them who come here and tell you that they can just whip out a first draft um, and, and sell it, it's because they've done it so many times that they, they absolutely know what they're doing. But it also means that it's easy for them to say, oh, just show, don't tell. They honestly don't know how to break it down for you anymore. So that's what I'm gonna try to attempt to do is to break it down. The second part of my disclaimer is to make sure that you understand that neither showing nor telling is inherently bad. <laughs> they are both useful writer's tools. Good writing happens when the writer has certainty of when you're using one and or the other so that you can wield those tools like those experts. Since it's telling that typically causes the wheels to fall off the Lexus, it's typically telling that gets targeted for heavy editing. And my third part of the disclaimer is something that I say every time I talk to Southwest writers is, before you write anything, make sure you've identified who you're writing for. This is really more important than people give it credit for. In the days of old, there's my old storyteller, you had to learn to hold the attention of a live audience. Even friends and family could literally walk away anytime they weren't engaged by the story. Think of how that must have made some storytellers feel. And think about how that real-time learning of what their audience didn't want improved their stories. Learn about your audience and write for your audience. And then imagine and visualize your people, your fans, and yes, your friends and family. These people deserve the best you can offer them not what needs to be buried in the backyard. Next slide, Brenda. So my first piece of advice to you is for first drafts, and it was Anne, I think she, she's gone now, but she said that she had completed a first draft. Way to go. <laughs> um, just get those first drafts written. Um, how many, again, let's put our hands up. How many of you are writing a first draft right now? That's great, that's really encouraging. All right, but now we get to the downside. How many have been working on that draft for more than six months? Uh-huh. <laughs> I know this, my first child's book, children's book, I had it for 20 years before I actually published it, so you know. <laughs> Anybody here who's been working on it for longer than a year? Uh-huh, okay. You all just need to write those first drafts. Get them off your plate, get them written. Get them written any way you like. Here at Southwest Writers, a lot of um, speakers, another thing they like to tell you, it, they like to get into this discussion of whether you're a writer by the seat of your pants or whether you're a writer who plots things. Personally, 
I've started to kind of find it a little annoying because I don't really think it matters. It doesn't matter how you write your first draft. The main thing is just write it. Uh, for sure, that first draft is going to be filled with uh, grammatical errors, verb disagreements, time and space issues. These are my favorite things to edit when you send in your challenge stories, by the way. <laughs> Um, there's going to be characters who may be eliminated because they serve no real purpose. Again, I'm going to just reiterate, none of this matters in your first draft. In your first draft, you should just enjoy discovering your process of writing, your passion for writing, and simply participating in the ancient act of creation. Just do it. Finishing a first draft should be a great cause for celebration. Have a drink. <laughs> but it is not a cause for sharing. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't share your first drafts with anyone. And you know why? Because the most excellent first drafts contain heaps of your own guts spilled onto the page. And these are truly, and I'm not kidding here, they're truly too raw for public viewing, okay? You can't handle what people are going to say about it, for one thing. So you don't let them. <laughs> Instead of showing off your first draft, set it aside for a couple weeks, tie it up with a ribbon, make it special, and then take it out again and start on your second draft. Besides improving your story each time you edit through it, any draft after your first is also a test of your commitment to the story. Truly serious writers will journey from the thrill of the first draft through the drudgery or even third, fourth, fifth drafts if necessary. Now, some of my favorite Southwest writer speakers are the ones who are honest about how many drafts it takes to perfect even a short story that your friends, family, editors, and publishers will be thrilled to read. We had one speaker here who said that he routinely writes 16 drafts. I loved him. <laughs> to me, most aspects of the second draft is where the editing involves looking for areas where you are telling when you should be showing. Showing, or I like to say revealing your story to your readers, is vital to any form of writing that involves a story. And there are more forms of writing that involve a story that you might think, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of those too, so all you nonfiction writers get ready. The more you practice showing your stories rather than telling them, the easier and the more fun it becomes to apply what you know even as you write a first draft. So what are the de details that make the difference between showing and telling? Go ahead, Brenda. I'll start with the most difficult to master. I see it's misplaced my E. I don't think a lot of my slides are coming through exactly the way I had planned them, but okay. This one, this slide is about voice. So the Voices, I'm just going to read this for you off the screen, the different way each person associated with your story speaks, thinks, perceives his world, and reveals his experiences to the reader. Each character in your story has a voice. The narrator has a voice, and you, the writer, have a voice. These are separate voices. And the more unique each of these voices is from the others, the more, the more vibrant your story becomes. Problems most often start when the writer's voice pervades. Go ahead, Brenda. Let me make you see. So this is some reasons that the writer's voice might take over your story. The story is not well plotted. Characters are not fully developed or the writer's main focus is not the story, the characters, or the audience. Instead, his focus is to air his own story, to preach his own rhetoric, or to teach just about anything. So what I'm saying is, 
if your message is more important that, than your characters are to your story, you're going to have problems. And you're probably going to come to a really big, uh, quote unquote, writer's block very quickly. The first two of these bullets seem really obvious, and you can tell that I really want to get into that third bullet. <laughs> so we're just going to go right in. And the reason is because writers often don't realize that their story has devolved into what I call screeching, preaching, and teaching. And this happens a lot. <laughs> and if, after some soul searching, which I advise you all to do, especially if you're stopped, and especially if you feel like you want, you definitely have a message that you want to convey. If you realize that your story isn't working because you're trying so hard to construct it around what should rightly be a commentary, a letter to the editor, or maybe a manifesto, then be honest with yourself. Chuck that first story draft in the trash right now and write what you want to say to the people who you want to say it to. But if you're determined to write a good story, just remember, the story cannot take a backseat to a message because the message alone is first-class telling and you'll be in trouble. Writers who successfully impart a message are those who create characters and imbue them with their own passion and allow the characters to live through their story events in order to show the message rather than preach it. Let your characters show why anyone or everyone should have an emotional response to your pet issue. Allowing the characters to take over is showing. Showing is the best form of teaching possible, but it's a craft. And we all know it takes a lot more time than writing a letter to the editor. Once you've decided to trust your characters to show your story, you're starting to set yourself up for entering the elusive and magical zone. This is where characters are taking off on, on, a, on all their adventures and you, the writer, are barely hanging on to a thread of their flying carpet. We all kind of live for this experience as writers, but that can never happen if your voice is bigger than your character's voices, and if you are so focused on conveying a message that you can't allow your characters to have their own opinions. Creating strong characters and allowing them to carry their story is why so many speakers come to Southwest Writers with hints and tips and character outlines under their arm. They want to help you get to know the characters who will live through your plot line of events. A pervasive writer's voice will also tend to make all the characters sound the same. If even a few of them sound the same as you, react like you would, and make decisions that you would make, without a doubt, you're telling, not showing. If you write memoir, keep in mind that the voice of you yesterday is not the voice of you today. At any moment in the past, you were a different person experiencing things that are memories now, but which were real events connected to real emotions back in the day. For the purposes of your memoir story, it pays to remember that past you is a character in your story with a voice of her own. Now you might also be a character, a different character, with her own distinctive voice. And writer you is a separate voice from both of them. The more distinction, again, that you can manage between these voices, the richer your memoir will become. But without distinctive voices, memoir devolves into recounting. And guess what? <laughs> recounting is telling. Go ahead, Brenda. Thank you. All right, there are a few other forms of nonfiction writing that have come into really wide use now. The book cover that you see there is my well-worn copy of 
John Franklin's writing for story. John Franklin was a um, writer in the, in the 1970s. And he, uh, a lot of people think that he is the actual first person to really come up with creative nonfiction. Um, some, uh, we've had a couple speakers in here actually in the last couple of months who have also brought up John Franklin because for me, I've been using him as my go-to writer guide since the 1990s um, because he really tells you how to pump up the action in nonfiction. Uh, I'm going to just read you a couple paragraphs from his Pulitzer Prize winning story. He wrote, he, he won two Pulitzer Prizes, and this is the first one that was the first Pulitzer given for creative nonfiction. It's called Mrs. Kelly's Monster. In the cold hours of a winter morning, Dr. Thomas Barbie Ducker, chief brain surgeon at the University of Maryland Hospital, rises before dawn. His wife serves him waffles, but no coffee. Coffee makes his hands shake. In downtown Baltimore, on the 12th floor of University Hospital, Edna Kelly's husband tells her goodbye. For 57 years, Mrs. Kelly shared her skull with the monster. No more. Today, she is frightened, but determined. It is 6.30 a.m. I'm not afraid to die, she said, as the day approached. I'm going to leave you there. <laughs> John, Fitch, John Franklin showed what was possible using a combination of news facts infused with actual human emotion. Creative nonfiction in itself doesn't allow your creativity to stretch into the territory of making things up. If he, if John Franklin includes dialogue in this story, which he did there where she said, I'm not afraid to die. And if you read the whole thing, then she goes on to a very long actually um, quote. But because he's writing nonfiction, his quotes must be accurate or he will be called to task for that. So just know that um, if you're writing anything, now memoir doesn't necessarily have those rules. Memoir, um, you know, unless you're writing about some well-known person or you're writing about someone in your life who may be upset by what you say they said when they didn't say it, you, you have a lot of latitude. If you're writing about a fishing excursion with your Uncle Ben, you can pretty much take certain things that happened in your mind and turn them into dialogue, you're not going to have any problem with that. No one's going to check those, those facts. And you shouldn't worry about them with memoir. Okay, the next one, Brenda. <clears throat> Another group of people that has really run with the whole creative nonfiction thing are biographers. And you can see, I hope you can see up there, um, I've got David McCullough, Laura Hildebrand, which she wrote Unbroken, Sylvia Nassar, who wrote A Beautiful Mind, and Ron Chernow, whose book, whose cover is up there of Alexander Hamilton. You may or may not know that, he, that this book inspired um, the whole Hamilton rage that's going on right now, or has been for a couple of years. These are just a few examples of biographers who took the idea of writing about a biographical subject and through their skills with creative nonfiction, they were able to take it deeper than the traditional study and recording of historical facts would have otherwise allowed them. Because of these creative nonfiction biographers and their extensive research, the reader gets to enter and experience the past from a point of view much closer than ever before to that of the subject human who lived and died before we were even born. <clears throat> I'm just gonna give you a quick example of David McCullough's biography, and I'm gonna read a couple of paragraphs from John Adams. And I'm assuming that we all know that Abigail was John Adams' wife <laughs> as I go on here. Then on July 16th came a letter from Abigail's uncle, Isaac Smith, reporting that Abigail, acting on her own, had decided that she and the children must be inoculated for smallpox. 
they had come to Boston to undergo the treatment. Smith himself, having provided his large house on Court Street for their time of isolation, Adams was beside himself. Never, never in my life, he said, had I so many cares upon my mind at once. And this is what he wrote to her. There are a couple things that I want to point out in these paragraphs. First of all, you have the sentence, Adams was beside himself. 100% telling. And I bring this up because this is a perfect example of, of the power of telling. Because McCullough just didn't leave it at that, and good writers will never tell you something and just let you sit with that thought. What they do is they go on to describe how being beside himself felt to John Adams. What did he have to say about it? Okay, and the next thing is the quote from John Adams where he absolutely tells you how he felt about it. So this use of telling is a wonderful way to get some up and down flow in your writing. Use the telling to slow things down or call attention to something of specific importance. And then you launch into the showing to reveal how that impacted the character and what he did about it. And again, biographers do not have the luxury of making up quotes for famous people. <laughs> if, if McCullough writes it as a quote, you can assume that through his research, he found this quote in an actual document written by John Adams. And it was probably even more than that. I'm sure it was even you know, certified and stamped that yes, this is something that he did say to his wife in a letter. All right. So another, another place where creative nonfiction is um, being used today is in the last decade or so, the power of a well-shown story that makes people feel something has come into use by everyone from federal, state, and local governments to motorcycling attorneys, fertility doctors, Roofers with fiddles and guy, the guys who pump septic tanks have all learned to include a story about themselves, their customers, or their potential customers in their advertising. To be effective, any story, even a 30 second one, requires showing through the voice of a main character whose thoughts and feelings tap into the emotions of the target audience. Stories are even used nowadays to sell stories. With authors hitting their target audience in the heart with an arrow of revealing details about their own life or about how they wrote the story or the person or event that inspired the story. Go ahead. Okay, and I just want to say that in case there's any misunderstanding, when you're in love with your long descriptions, your long poetic descriptions, just know that descriptions are facts. And facts are what? Facts are telling. <laughs> so even your most beautiful descriptions are telling. Narrating facts and descriptions is the purest and most commonly used form of telling. But it is telling that is often needed. Just when you're writing it, when you're including it in your manuscript, keep in mind that telling the facts, no matter how beautiful they are, they don't invite the reader to lose himself in your setting. They don't allow your character to tell his own story through his own eyes and with his voice. Here's an example. Let's say your character is riding a black steed down a country road lined with an exploding sunset of orange poppies. What I wanna know is, does he smell the poppies? What do, what do poppies even smell like? Does he consider him, them beautiful? Or maybe do they remind him of someone or something he'd rather forget? The question really is, what is the relevance of these poppies to your reader, to your character? 
okay, what if he's riding past the poppies and he doesn't even notice the poppies? Do you say, there was this amazing field of poppies that he rode right past without even seeing them because he was so preoccupied with his problems? No, 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 no. <laughs> if your character doesn't notice the poppies, you don't get to include the poppies. Even if the description of poppies is the best thing you ever wrote. You've heard of killing your darlings. This is it. Take it out. If he notices them, his notice of them must have relevance to something in his past or in his future that makes a huge difference to the story. If it doesn't, you still have to kill it. In other words, unless a wicked witch is about to poison him among the poppies, you will get to save some words by cutting this unneeded description of poppy fields. All right, here's another one. How many of you, truly, how many of you have watched a few episodes or more of Yellowstone? Good job. I know Sherry Burr has. <laughs> because Sherry Burr wrote about it in the Sage. <laughs> All right. So have you ever noticed how often John Dutton comments on a beautiful sunset or hugs the governor of Montana while admiring the vast gorgeousness of his empire. This is not idle or unnecessary gazing inserted by a writer or producer with a mission to get viewers to appreciate the Montana sunset or, or to connect with the sunset so they will learn and understand the need to protect the Montana wilderness. Each of these moments is intended to draw the viewer into the knowledge of everything John Dutton has to lose. Every time he gazes at the sunset, we gain a deeper understanding of what drives this character. This is what makes the sunset relevant. Empathy for the character or for other characters in the Yellowstone story may indeed lead some viewers to understand and appreciate all the beauty and resources that need preserving in Montana and elsewhere. But the writers know they have to show you the tears in John Dutton's eyes because telling you how he feels about the land, even in his own words, falls flat. So I advise you, save your own amazing descriptions of the sunset until you can find a time where it has meaning for your character that increases your reader's empathy for that character and that will possibly drive your underlying message home. And that's what you want. All right, Brenda. Now we're gonna go back a minute to John Franklin. John Franklin's superpower is active verbs. And I'm a, because I like John Franklin, I love active verbs, <laughs> but active verbs can be confusing. Um, John Franklin has an inno innovative way in his book of structuring his stories that uses a system of outlining the action and he pairs it down to the bare bones of subject, action verb, object. The idea here is not to tie writers to the bulky and time consuming structure of an outline. In fact, his chapter entitled The Outline <laughs> um, is kind of a tongue-in-cheek look at how we're all taught to outline in school and he just he despises it. In fact, he didn't use outlines for many, many years. And then he devised this subject verb object form of an outline. Action, uh, and, and the reason he did that was to help you always keep the action in your mind as you're writing. It's just so you can have a little um, you know, side that says, okay, what is my main action here? Because action is what's going to drive your story. Action is your showing. We all know the passive verbs, to be, I hope we do, <laughs> to have, to look, to feel. Um, you know, there's a million of them. These are verbs that are, are they don't convey any or very little action. You won't, your character cannot tell you what it's like to be. He cannot show you what it's like to be, 
okay? So this is why we consider these kind of passive verbs. Um, I have some passive verbs that I take pains to avoid. I'm pretty sure some of you do too. I personally, I avoid the two be's and two haves. If you're interested in the outline, you can take my class in September <laughs> because um, I'm going to recommend that anybody who does take the class in September should uh, get the book because we are going to go through how this outline can really pump up the action in your stories. If you're not taking my class, the book is available on Amazon. So the next slide, we're going to talk about, we're going to take just one verb. It's to suffer. We all know how to conjugate the verb. <laughs> so, um, so when we're judging this verb, do we look at it and say, is this an active verb or a passive verb? And this is kind of the confusion of verbs because in a way it depends on how it's used. So in um, example A, uh, we have our verb to suffer, but it's really being used in a telling kind of a way. Harriet suffered unspeakably at the hands of her cruel stepmother. We get no insight into Harriet as a character in this, um, her in this sentence, which is why it's telling. It's pure narration. It is the writer telling what's going on with Harriet. It's not Harriet having any input into um, how she feels about this. The, did she, does Harriet feel like she's suffering? We don't know. Okay. So um, that's, that's the problem with, it's the difficulty of learning the difference. And really the difference is, did your character have a say in it? Okay, um, if character were, if Harriet were a human being, she might actually object to being, to having her situation characterized that way. And I do try to look at my characters and go, okay, would I, would I talk about them to their face this way? Would I tell this part of their story without their consent? So the idea is consult your characters, get in there with them. So example B is, showing Harriet suffered her stepmother's blows in silence. No matter what happened, she vowed she would not cry. This is showing because we do, in this case, get some insight into Harriet, how she felt about this suffering, what she intended to do about what was happening to her. Suffering becomes a more active adventure for Harriet in example B. It is actually something we know she agrees that she is doing. So in your writing, show me how your character is suffering or doing anything. Use active verbs to tell me how the suffering feels in her body and how does she process it in her mind? What kind of emotions, what kind of emotions does her suffering produce? And what does she do in response to her suffering? How does she react to it? All right. Thank you, Brenda. So there are a few other parts of speech that I think should be paid attention to in second drafts. And um, honestly, commas, periods, misplaced prepositions, they're, they're not among them. So we're not going to be talking about those right now because to me, those are fourth or later issues. And part of that reason is because you're still in your second draft. If you start paying attention to periods and commas and all of that minutia, <laughs> what happens when you spent so much time and then you decide to just X out a whole page? And you've spent all this time editing all your comments, commas and periods. So even though, I mean, I have an eye for that stuff. So sometimes a comma kind of just rubs me the wrong way and I got to rub it out. And I will do that. But I don't make it my mission in the second draft to deal with that stuff. What I do make it my mission to deal with is, go ahead, Brenda, is adverbs. Adverbs are those pesky modifiers that many writers think are totally adding punch to their sentences. Generally, they don't. Actually, most adverbs have exactly the opposite effect. They slowly drain the very life from your story. 
One of the easiest ways, I think, to edit a first draft into something that is at least beginning to show is to highlight all your adverbs and then go back and try to rewrite all of those sentences using active verbs. This will result in more specific and active descriptions, actions, emotions, and events. Besides the LY family of adverbs, which I assume you're all somewhat familiar with, other overused adverb favorites include very, even, like they couldn't even speak, and quite. Do yourself a favor, draw a line for them wherever they occur. You rarely, if ever, need them. Unless you have a character who uses them as a pattern in their speech. All right, on the next slide. All right. The next slide is metaphors, similes, and analogies. Metaphor is poetically saying something is something else. Simile is saying something is like something else. Analogy is saying something is like something else to make an explanatory point. You can use metaphors and similes when creating an analogy. To be successful, these metaphorical forms must be relevant to your story and they must be rooted in memories of things your readers should be familiar with. So if you're writing sci-fi fantasy and that's your audience and you say, Clyde was James T. Kirk disappearing on a photon stream. You can expect this sci-fi fantasy audience to understand that reference, to get that metaphor. <clears throat> Many successful novelists, songwriters, and playwrights have a knack for seeing the world in simile and metaphor. I recently was listening to a, a TED Radio Hour interview with Roseanne Cash. And she is also, uh, besides her father, she's also in her own right, a very famous and accomplished musician. And she talked about the very first time she understood the concept of metaphor. And you could even see on her face that this was a truly enlightening moment for her because she finally got the power of metaphor. And make no mistake, Metaphor and simile, once you've mastered them, they are one of the most powerful tools you can use in any form of writing. And the reason is because they're based in the memory of your reader. You can only get a metaphor if it means something to you, if it sparks a memory in you as the reader. Roseanne Cash said that from the very, that very first moment, metaphors excited her and she started looking around for them. Um, her first metaphor, she wrote it down, like a little kid, she wrote it down and um, she didn't even use it for 12 years. So it, it was 12 years before she actually put that metaphor in a song. I thought that was pretty, it was a lot of waiting. But I advise all of you to get excited about similes and metaphors. Actually, for this talk, I wanted to, I had planned to include music as part of this uh, because I, I listen to a lot of different kinds of, of music and some old music, some new music, but songwriters in general are those lucky kinds of people who do kind of see the world in metaphor. So one of, one of the metaphors that I thought of when I was thinking about this talk was, so you have Neil Diamond, the old crooner who we all know and many of us were in love with. And when he has a, uh, a line about a sexual invitation, what does he say? He says, play me. Okay, today is a different audience. It's a completely different audience. And now we have Bishop Briggs, who just came out from under a costume on a show called... What is it called? It's the one where they wear the costumes and they sing. Like, 
the mass singer she just won it she just she just won this and i didn't even know it, but she's been one of my favorites for for many years because of her great metaphors that she is in her song so so when she talks about a sexual invitation what does she say <laughs> she's a she's a new age tattooed kind of strong girl and she says shut your mouth and run me like a river <laughs> so this is speaking to two different two completely different audiences and and i love that that difference and yet both are strong how many of us I mean, we can sing a lot of the lyrics to Play Me because we were his audience and we loved him. And that's why. <laughs> so there are ways, and I've done this, there are ways to train your mind to explain the world that you see in metaphor. Um, just look around. Are there golfers on the golf course that could be described as cranes poking their crooked beaks into the ground? How else might you describe them? What does your neighborhood look like? Um, what else could your neighborhood be that simultaneously describes what it is? Does it look like a Norman Rockwell painting? Or does it look more like a place where dead bodies are hidden? Okay, these are vague. You can get a lot more specific with your metaphors. Practice making metaphors in your head all the time. I'm gonna tell you, making metaphors can be a great substitute to inventing lives for strangers in restaurants. And I know you all do that. <laughs> they, they can and they will be lousy metaphors. They'll be trite similes. It doesn't matter. Keep going. You'll get better at seeing the world in metaphor and simile. And that will make it easier to write them. Your metaphors also have to relate to your setting, your plot, and to the character who is speaking, living, and thinking them. If you're writing romance, the dead bodies metaphor would only work if your two romantic characters are having a bonding adventure in a ghost town or maybe a cemetery. I don't know. All right, Brenda, thanks. Okay, I'm going to go through this dialogue is another one of the greatest tools for showing. Um, <clears throat> dialogue and character thoughts are the obvious way your character gets to express her all showing voice in your story. We've all played at that exercise where you write an entire short story in only dialogue. It's still one of my favorite loosener uppers before I start to write a section that I know will contain lots of important information to be communicated to the audience. If you want your manuscript to shine in the showing department, reveal to your audience by having your characters speak it. Going back to our character on his black steed, riding past poppy fields, let's now say that there is a wicked witch planning to poison him among those poppy fields. In this case, he must notice the poppies. If he's a kind of clueless character, he might notice them casually while riding and eating a ham sandwich. His thoughts might run toward, those are mighty pretty poppies. Maybe Maggie likes some of them. If he's a more astute kind of a guy, an odd feeling might come over him as he approaches the poppies. It's a beautiful sight, but his thoughts are more likely to run toward something doesn't feel right around here. No matter which of these guys the character is, this snippet of insight in, into who he is can prove valuable in the next couple sentences. The first character will stop, get off his horse, bend over to pick poppies, and possibly die there with mustard on his shirt. The second character might pick his way carefully along the road, watching for any sign of trouble. Or he might just spur his horse and get the heck out of there, leading to a nice follow-up scene of an angry, foiled witch chasing him on a broomstick at full speed. 
All right. So with that, that's about all I can do for you today. <laughs>